Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video. This week we're going to finish up the new Skaven Warp Blaster. I'm going to take you through two specific items. How I do the Warp Stone or Warp Glow in this army, like that awesome green poppiness you're going to need throughout your Skaven, and how I weather out my metals. Because it really, we all know Skaven, they don't keep everything in such nice condition. Let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V style. All right, so let's finish up this Warp Blaster. This thing is so freaking cool. I love it. So we're going to start with the Warp Glow. And I begin by just laying down a base coat of ivory over the whole thing. I'm turning this all ivory because when we're going to use these bright greens, bright yellows, we need to have a bright base coat down there to work off of. The next thing I'm going to use is this green and yellow set from Rogue Hobbies. I love these two. They are perfect for this kind of Skaven Warp Glow. I begin by just base coating the whole thing green. Now you'll notice when I start, I'm not really worrying about like the little threads and stuff like that. I don't care. Those can get messy. We're going to fix them later. Okay? But I just turn all the green things green. Very simple. I'm then going to come in with my Tenebris Gray, thinned way down which is close enough to a black, and I'm going to go ahead and black line in between that uh, cut in the, in the tube, as well as like around all the little threads and everything like that. Basically, I'm gonna make sure there's a nice dark line separating all of the little individual elements so the green looks brighter. When you have things that are very bright, they create very strong shadows, hence why it's okay to go to the black here. Now, from this step, what we're gonna do is just start integrating in a lot of the yellow in the middle and a little bit of the black at the edges. So there's kind of a two-step process here. So first I start integrating in a little bit of the yellow, a little bit more, a little bit more, and I work it less and less and less and less. In this case I want to make it look like the center of the thing is the hottest, but you could do this in multiple steps. You could have it be pulsing through there. So you could have like one, two, three highlight areas. You could push it towards the edges and have the dark part in the middle. Any of those things would be fine. It's just about creating the illusion of travel so that you have it moving from dark to light to dark, or dark light, dark light, dark light, and so on. However you want to do it. I'm going to go for one solid, real punchy glow in the middle, and all I'm doing is adding more and more and more and more yellow to my green until eventually I'm doing final, very thin glazes of just the pure yellow. Now, I also add in a little bit of the black, uh, to, to then hit the edges and darken them down effectively where it's touching the machine itself I want it to be darker than the base green so that there's actual travel there It's a pretty simple process. There's nothing too complicated about it I repeat the same thing on the lenses that are here uh, as well um, As the smaller tubes and even the tip of the guns same process for all of this. You'll see what the, the actual barrels of the guns look like at the end of the video. But once that's all wrapped up and I have my bright yellow spot in the middle with just a hint of green, because the green's going to show through that yellow, uh, going out to the dark green black on the sides, my warp glow for this thing is ready to rock and looks like it's pulsing throughout the entire machine. Uh, and that's just it. I looked for everywhere I could hide this color. I want to just take a quick moment to talk to you about these bright colors. When you're using really intense punchy colors that are highly saturated like this, it's important that they are distributed around the miniature evenly. So hence why I have them in the barrels of the gun, on the small tubes in front of his arm, in his eye goggles, the little lens, the tubes on both sides, that kind of thing. I want it so when you're looking at it, you'll see the green, uh, no matter sort of what angle you turn it, there will be green dispersed around the figure. Okay? That helps bring those highly saturated colors into balance and make sure that they're nice and punchy. Okay, so with that out of the way, it's now time to turn to the more complicated element, which is the weathering. And we're going to go ahead and do this in stages. We want to mess this thing up in the appropriate ways uh, that make it look natural and credible as worn, but still functional. And that's important. So what do I mean by still 
uh, functional. Well, if you make it a completely rusted hunk of junk, it's going to be obvious that it doesn't drive, it doesn't go anywhere, it's not meant to actually move. So we need to have very credible weathering here. So we're going to start very simply. You'll notice I've already got a little transition. I already did the base, the metals. That is to say, I shaded them and highlighted them and so on. But we're going to start by laying in some very thin, warm brown, uh, again from Proacryl, into the shadow areas wherever there's pits, dents, chips, uh, cracks, or edges where two joints of metal come together. This is the key. You want to find homes for this where water would naturally gather and where you're building on what the sculpt is telling you. So wherever there's recesses, cracks, cracks, scratches, pits, and or joints, that's where I start to place some of these glazes. And I start very lightly. I, this isn't going to, once it dries, you really don't see much of it. It just gives you a light brown tone. I work my way around the miniature, repeatedly applying these glazes to all of the different potential areas. The reason you want to focus on things like joints, like where two metals come together, or around rivets, or stuff like that, is because that's where liquid water will gather. And so where you have anything that like condensation or liquid would naturally gather, it will start oxidizing the metal at an accelerated rate and rust. So when we work in a very natural way like this, we get credible results. For the same reason in my next step, uh, I'm going to start focusing on edges. So my next step after I've sort of glazed all of these things around is I'm going to reinforce some of these areas, covering less, working smaller and more targeted with a thicker layer consistency of the warm brown. Still very simple, still the same paint, but it will have a very different effect than the very thin glaze we were using before. Yet again, now I'm going to focus on things like edges, but also those deep scratches, chips, and ruts. And I'm going to lay a little bit of that brown in there, covering less than I did with my glaze. So we'll get this nice natural transition where it looks like the rust has spread and bloomed out very naturally. All of the successive steps I do from this point, I cover less and less and less each time to bring forward the fresh rust in only those particular places. So my steps from here are to begin integrating in my fluorescent orange. So this right here is some of the Pro Acryl um, fluorescent orange. Mix it in with my brown, and I'm going to start uh, basically hitting less and less space, working more towards the edges, towards the deepest part of the recesses, towards some of the larger joints. Uh, I'm going to absolutely pick a few rivets here and there and really focus in on them and make sure they're completely rusted out. Rivets are one of those things that are very nice to rust because it just looks very credible and natural because the water gathers around it. Uh, so, uh, so realistically in our normal everyday lives, we see it. So I then add more orange and more orange until eventually uh, I'm working in pure fluorescent orange. And with that pure Pro Acryl fluorescent orange, I'm then going to sort of tip and tap along some of the edges. I'm going to tap the rivets themselves uh, and so on to make sure that all of that area has just those very fine lines of the fresh, most intense rust. I'm focusing on things like edges and the deepest recesses, the deepest scratches, because those would have the most water gathering and or be the most susceptible to chipping and scratching and hence disturbing the surface where then water can get in and naturally build rust. The next thing we're going to do, since this thing is a machine, like this isn't an organic being, it's a, it's a machine, it rolls around, it's most of the time going to be straight up, it probably sits there for a long time in dark or dank or wet or moist environments, and so we're going to do some very simple streaking. So from those rust areas, I take a little bit of the orange and brown mixed together, and I begin just running thin streaks down. This is just the paint. We don't need to use anything special or magical as a product. And on all those flat surfaces, I start to run down streaks. And this really does sell the credibility because now you see how the water is not only sitting and had caused the rust, but you actually see how then the 
fresh water, hit that rust, ran out, and left behind this detritus, this stain on the metal. It just makes it look so realistic and credible. So I basically begin working my way around and I'm just doing lots of thin streaks. I let them dry, I come back in. Some of them I reinforce doing a second streak over the same place. Some of them I do new smaller streaks, longer streaks. Variance is the key to natural looking weathering. So the streaks I'm doing lots of different sizes. I'm making sure that they're of different and varied intensities. Some are very short, some run the whole gamut of the, the metal plate. Some are very intense. Some are just one thin, basically glazed streak, and you only really see it if you look carefully. And everything in between. I repeat the process a few times with actually just a pure brown in some places where to just show like muddy water that's run that wasn't actually rust. I do a few of those again as a very thin glaze and we're good to go. Now, that's gonna be most of my intense weathering. Right there, we're looking pretty good. The problem is the stone that's, or the, sorry, the wood that's next to it doesn't really look that weathered and it as well sits there. But when wood gets really wet, it doesn't rust, it's, it's not metal, it doesn't oxidize. Instead, it builds some moss. So we're gonna take some uh, Athonian camo shade, but you can use any kind of green that you want, depending on how intense you want this to be. And I'm going to start uh, doing some very gentle washes on some of the areas nearest the metal, where the water would again, where joints overlap, where there's two different sections sitting together, that's where the water will naturally be able to collect and build. And so that's where we would naturally get that pooling on the thing that would cause moss to build up. So I work my way around the model, uh, just going ahead and laying in some of those green tones. Uh, you can push this as far as you want. Um, but again, it's that thing that makes, if you're going to have the metal look weathered and rusted, then all of the things that are there and around that need to reflect the same thing. I'm going to go stronger with this when I eventually do my bases. Uh, let me talk about that as we close out here. With that, the weathering's done, but I'm not done weathering. Let me explain. As I'm working on this army, I'm not doing the bases yet. So the final step I will do when it comes to actually putting these things on bases, once I get my whole basing team together and prepare them, is I'll be hitting those bases with a lot of pigment to make them look natural. When I do that, all of the models are going to be glued on, and then I'm going to also hit the lower areas of the models with that same pigment. So I'm going to come back in at that time with brown and green and red pigment and such, and hit the bottom of cloaks, the feet, you know, of some of my clan rats, and as well on this thing, the lower wood and wheels. They'll get dusted up. So if you're going to take this all the way, don't forget that last critical pigment step. Um, I have videos on how to use pigment, but that will be something I do as I'm basing. There will be a future video once I figure out what the heck I'm going to do for basing for this army. Don't worry. But I did want to take a moment here to say, you know, it has to be into, to really fully sell the weathering, it has to be integrated into its environment. Okay, with that, let's take a look at how this bad boy came out. Again, pre-basing. Here's how it came out. I really like this fig. I think it's so much fun. It was a great time to paint. I hope you enjoyed uh, coming along on this journey with me. Uh, I, this is a great model. Uh, you can see the, how the barrels came out. I think they look really cool, like the building up the sort of warp energy to shoot. I hope you like the look as well. Uh, at any rate, thank you so much for watching this one. If you liked it, give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you've got any questions about anything, drop those down in the comments below. I always answer every question and read every comment. If you want to support the channel, there's so many ways to do so. Not only can you do the free things like hitting like and subscribe, there's affiliate links down below. You can hit those to pick up your, your hobby supplies. Doesn't cost you anything extra. In fact, it often saves you money. Uh, and yet it gives the channel a nice kickback. I really appreciate that. It's one of the best things you can do to help the channel. If you're gonna buy something, buy it through one of my links. It's a big help. Of course, if you wanna go all the way, there's our Patreon focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. We'd love to have you as part of the community. As always though, I thank you so much for watching this one and we'll see you next time.